Thank you. Okay. So hi everyone. Uh, my name is Abir Sabal. I am the Community Engagement Coordinator at the Palestinian American Community Center in Clifton, New Jersey. Um, I'm here to talk us through building solidarity and community uh, in this political moment. Um, I think a lot has evolved, changed, looks different now than when we first um, kind of conceptualized. And even in planning this process, a lot of it has changed. But I think focusing on solidarity in general and allyship in general never hurts and is always a good place to start no matter what the political moment. Um, so that's what I'm going to take us through today. I kind of going to have it in two parts or one I'm just going to talk about general solidarity, grassroots organizing and allyship, um, which I actually like to move away from that word and use the word accomplice. But for the sake of this and time, I'm just going to go with that word. Um, and then I'll take us into solidarity with Palestine specifically, what that has looked like, what that can look like, et cetera. Um, real quickly, before I start, I always do community agreements, even if we're in a vir virtual space, um, especially when talking about issues like this and solidarity and identity and things that, you know, that, that can trigger things or bring up certain things. I just want to make sure we're all mindful of these community agreements. These are just the ones that I usually prepare and put up. If at any point or at this moment, anyone wants to add anything to it, please let me know and we can always add um, to the community agreements. But the first one is one mic. So, I mean, it's a webinar function, but when one person is talking, only that person should be talking. Uh, what's learned here leaves here and what's shared here stays here. Um, this again, it's different because we're in a webinar function, but if folks do share personal stories or reflections or things about their identity, I just want to make sure that that personal stuff that is shared stays in this virtual space, unless someone lets you share that for them in a different space. Um, but the larger, you know, a larger theme or the larger story or lesson behind what they shared is something that we can, of course, take into other spaces. But the person's specific identity or name or um, specific stories they share should not be taken away. Uh, impact versus intent. Um, so it's, I think it's self-explanatory, but just always think about um, the impact of your words, no matter what your intention was. So you might've had the best intention I think I just got muted. Um, you might have not had the best, the, the, an intention to hurt someone or to say something. Okay, I don't know what's going on, but I keep getting muted. Um, so just keep in mind or keep, be mindful of that, right? That your words and actions can have an impact that might have been different from your intent. And when someone does tell you about that impact, take that seriously before getting defensive right away, even if you had the best of intentions. Uh, practice self and communal care. So of course, take care of yourself at any point if you need to. Um, and at the same time, think about the community that you are with in your virtual space. Um, so if you're disrupting a lot, if you're unmuting a lot, if you're taking up a lot of space, and that's we're gonna take, we're gonna get into that with the other ones, just be mindful of that and take care of the community that you're with. Be conscious of your positionality at all times. And we're gonna go through thinking about our identity and power and privilege. So just be conscious of that before speaking or reacting right away. Um, shared square, this kind of is a visual thing. You know, we're all sharing one square. So be mindful of how much space you take up. So if you're someone who's always the first to unmute or put something in the chat, maybe take a step back and allow for other folks to do that first. If you're someone who doesn't share often, maybe try to encourage yourself or gain some more confidence to share because everyone's viewpoints and identity is helpful and matters. And then of course, use I statements. So do not generalize or talk about communities at large, even if you hold that identity, we don't wanna homogenize people or their communities. Um, so when you are sharing something, talk about something, just practice using I statements and speaking for yourself. Um, hopefully we're all cool with these. I'm gonna keep us going for the sake of time. I wanna start off with a personal reflection um, I'm going to give everyone a couple of minutes, so it's 7-11, I'll do until 7-15, um, and I want you to just take a moment and answer these two questions. And they're on a piece of paper, if you want to write them down, if you just want to think about them. Um, what does social justice mean to you, and what does a free Palestine look like to you? And if folks want to share their answers in the chat, please feel free to do so, and I'll read a couple out loud.
Okay. Um, so I'll give us one or two more minutes. I'm going to start reading some of the answers that folks have put in the chat. So one, I have social justice. One piece of it is to each according to their needs from each according to their abilities. I like that answer. That reminds me of a um, definition of mutual aid too, which we'll, we'll get to. Um, another answer is social justice means that everyone has an opportunity to flourish as individual, sorry, sorry, as individuals and that the community has a responsibility to ensure that is accomplished. Also like the answer kind of goes into communal care as well. Um, anyone with a, what does a free Palestine look like? I don't feel like it's up to me to define that as Jew, but I believe in self-determination for the Palestinian people, including the right of return. Thank you, I actually very much like that answer because I think a lot of times when we answer this question, we forget about right of return and self-determination. Um, I also think of decolonization, right? I think of land back. I think of people returning back to villages and homes that they were displaced from. I think of freedom of movement. I think of happiness, the future, prosperity. Free Palestine means to me that everyone has freedom of movement throughout and in an in and out of the country, all have equal access to natural and man-made resources. Um, I'm sorry, I'm Mufahid, I've missed your answer. In our society means first to look for the need of the poor in our society, right? To find those who are most in need, equal participation in dealing with the ecological horror to come also. Right, interesting. Okay, um, so these are really good answer. I mean, there is no right or wrong answer. Well, there might be a wrong answer, but this was just more of like a, um, just to take a moment to personally reflect on a lot of what we are about to talk about. Um, I also want to encourage you all to um, try to see if your answer changes at all from now until the end, the, the end of our workshop. That might be interesting. Okay, um, so just to get into just the very basics of social justice. Um, I would normally ask how many people have seen this photo before. Um, I'm gonna assume a lot of people have seen this, right? I think a very basic um, understanding of social justice can begin with what is the difference between equality and equity, right? So clearly equality means everyone gets one box, but equity is taking us into a deeper level of people are gonna get as many boxes as they need based off of their needs and abilities, which I think was already kind of talked about in the chat. Uh, I'm gonna go back to the chat to read Amun Fahid's answer for free Palestine to end the brutal Israeli military occupation. Second, to creating a new society based on justice and equality for all. I don't feel like it's up to me as a Jew, especially in the US, but my personal dream would be a democratic state in all of Palestine and with the right of return for Palestinians and Jews like me don't have a right to be citizens there automatically. Thank you guys for those answers. Um, so to go back, right, so equality is, and there's a different metaphor of equality is giving everyone a shoe and equity is giving everyone a shoe that actually fits them, right? So sometimes, and a lot of the times, equality is not enough. And we're taught that equality is what is needed. And this can be translated very lit, uh, literally into talking about Palestine and um, the occupied Palestinian territories and, and Israeli rule over Palestine, right? Is it's not so where we're at right now, we get lost in a lot of peace treaties of we all just need to be equal and treated equally. But if we, but by just simplifying into that, then we're taking away the history of displacement and genocide and ethnic cleansing um, that happened in the past and continues to happen, right? And so we cannot say that Israelis and Palestinians need the same things when their everyday lives and the systems that they are under are not equal to them, themselves, right? And so we need to think about equity. Um, and what I actually like to do is take it a step further and uh, because equity to me is not always enough either and take us into this picture, right? And so where we add this picture is what the reality actually is, right? I think that one's self-explanatory, um, but the real vision and the real goal, right? And this is where what a free Palestine looks like to me is not more peace treaties and not more as important as those are humanitarian aid, all of that. Those are short-term, right? Reliefs and short-term goals. Long-term goal is liberation. Right, the long-term goal is decolonization. The long-term goal, the long-term goal is right of return and self-determination, land back, et cetera, et cetera. Right, for Palestinians and many other marginalized communities as well. And so that's where this image comes in, where we need to start questioning why is there a fence up there in the first place? 
Why are there people who can be inside and people who have to be outside? So as nice as it is that we're able to get from equality and equity, where we can get you know, this person high enough so that all of them can see and they can also be enjoying the game, they're still in the back, right? They're still behind the border. They're still not as equal as the people inside. And so the real goal is liberation. The real goal is no borders or fences in the first place. And then nobody would need I skipped the slide too fast, but basically nobody would need those boxes um, in the beginning, right? And that's what we should always be going towards. Um, and so before we can do that, we really need to understand what grassroots organizing and solidarity is like, because a lot of times what happens, unfortunately, is people work in solidarity or want to work in solidarity with other communities, um, communities that they are not a part of or do not share identities with, um, but often do that in a way that almost becomes um this like savior complex or a charity complex where you know i'm so great i get it or i have all this stuff let me give back to the people who don't right and this reminds me of um, a lot of people use this especially in protests and i actually very much do not like this phrase where people say we're here to give a voice for the voiceless right and that implies that some people were born with voices and some people weren't whereas the reality is everyone had a voice it's that some of voices are pushed down marginalized, deliberately erased, while the others aren't. So instead of thinking that I grew up with a voice and you didn't, therefore I need to speak for you, it's questioning why does my voice matter more than yours and what can I do to make sure your voice starts to matter and you can advocate for yourself, right? And so that's where I want us to just watch these two videos and reflect on them. And of course, the great Angela Davis, who hopefully no, needs no introduction, just has a, a short video of an explanation of solidarity versus charity um, and then democracy now, um, especially when COVID hit, right? A lot of folks are thinking about in this country, thinking about talking about mutual aid. And so kind of understanding the uh, going off the theme of solidarity, not charity um, and thinking about mutual aid instead. And I'm just gonna check the chat real quick. Solidarity um, has nothing to do with charity in the conventional sense. And unfortunately, people, you know, having been ideologically influenced by uh, the ways in which uh, charity unfolds, oh, let me help these poor people who are in, 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 in prison uh, because they're in such bad shape. And what often happens is that the, that the um, hierarchies and the, the inequalities are, are reproduced through what appears to be an effort to engage in solidarity. So, so we have to be very clear about uh, the fact that uh, solidarity involves uh, an egalitarian relationship between the parties. Uh, uh, and that uh, when we speak about solidarity with people in prison, uh, we, we have a respect for the knowledge that's produced by uh, 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 people behind bars. Uh, the um, epistemological you know, role of uh, prisoners has been central in terms of the way in which the movement has been crafted without the, the contributions of people inside, there's no way we would be uh, engaged in this kind of struggle today. There's no way that uh, the academic field that is called critical prison studies uh, could have uh, emerged. Uh, so um, yeah, solidarity uh, in, has to involve uh, uh, egalitarian uh, relationships and a commitment to break down the hierarchies that almost inevitably begin to assert themselves into relationships uh, uh, between people on the outside and people on the inside. Um, so actually for the sake of time, I'm just gonna show a short part of this Democracy Now! video. I just wanna make sure we have enough time for question or just discussion at the end too. But this is just basically feeding off of what Angela Davis was talking about. 
This is Democracy Now!, democracynow.org, The War and Peace Report. I'm Amy Goodman. We end today's show looking at the incredible community networks across the United States that are coming together to protect their neighbors during the coronavirus pandemic and how you can get involved as lockdowns and layoffs sweep the country, leaving millions at risk. Mutual aid groups are forming to protect and provide for the vulnerable, including the elderly, incarcerated, undocumented, and and unhoused. Their aim, solidarity, not charity. In Washington, the Tacoma Mutual Aid Collective is organizing free food programs for kids hit by school closures. In the Bay Area of California, the West Oakland Punks with Lunch is working with the houseless community and distributing lunch and supplies. In Arizona, Tucson Mutual Aid is coordinating food and supply drop-offs to people's front doors. In Colorado, the Denver Service Worker Solidarity Group is building a network to demand an immediate moratorium on rent, collection, and eviction citywide. In Minnesota, the Twin Cities Queer and Trans Mutual Aid Group is organizing assistance for queer, transgender, and gender non-binary people affected by COVID-19. Here in New York City, now the epicenter in this country, NYC United Against Coronavirus has put together a network of resources for child care, grocery delivery, food donations, housing needs, bail funds, and other types of support across the five boroughs. And those are just a few of the thousands of efforts. For more, we go to two of the hot spots of the pandemic, Seattle, Washington, and here in New York City. We're joined by- So I'm just gonna pause it there because um, it is a lot longer, but basically the reason I always wanna bring up mutual aid when we talk about solidarity or how to be in solidarity with folks is because I think it gives a perfect model, right? Is that we don't feed into a savior complex. We don't feed into this philanthropic charity complex of I have because I have, and that makes me better and you don't, but I care. So I'm going to give you, it's that we both have something that we both need, right? And so we, can, so I have something you need and you have something I need we exchange and through that our livelihood, our liberation, our, our just community feeds off of each other, right? It's not, it's not a, there are no hierarchies, there's no savior complex, everyone supports everyone and everyone supports each other. And I think that's often missed when we talk about allyship and solidarity, but is actually one of the key fundamentals to it. Um, this is Democracy Now! Demo um, so before getting into, again, other communities in Palestine um, and those specifics, and before we can be allies and be in solidarity with people, we need personal reflections of our own identities, right? And so normally if we had more time and we were in person, right, I would have us um, do a really long activity with this, but I'm kind of just going to have to brush over right now very quickly of these are the main identities and social categories that we should always be conscious of. Um, before getting into work with communities and while and during and after working with communities, especially communities, again, who our identities are not part of or who we don't always belong to, right? Um, the main ones being class, race, ethnicity, religion, body size and image, citizenship, status, gender, sexuality and sexual orientation, ability and age. Um, and there's, there's some that are the more, more obvious ones and there are some identities that are often forgotten but also very important, right? And so I'm not, you can see on the, the image, there's this what is called matrix of oppression. It's a little bit outdated, right? But it, it kind of breaks down each social category with, are you privileged? Are you oppressed? What kind of ism or type of oppression is it? Um, are there border social groups, right? I think that part is really important because, and if we use myself and as, as an example, um, racially, I am Arab, ethnically, I am Lebanese, um, I come from a low income working class family, um, I fall in the middle maybe of body size and image, I have American citizenship, um, I am a woman, I am cisgendered, um, I am for the most part, I am, I am able, right, I am physically able, um, there, right there, there's mental health issues that also come with ability, right? There are moments where I get, you know, I deal with a lot of anxiety. So you can kind of put that on the border too. And I am 27. So age kind of is, is more of the different one where if you're younger, there's a lot more advantages, right? But and then sometimes if you're older, there's a lot more advantages because when you're younger, people don't take you as seriously, right? So that some of them, especially age, I think is the only one that I would say is a little more fluid. Um, but in me just sharing my identities, there are clearly ways that I am privileged and clearly ways that I am not privileged. 
So for example, my citizenship status makes me privileged and more privileged than other folks. Uh, my gender definitely does not make me, right? I am very light skinned. Um, I'm sometimes white, kind of white passing, except for maybe my darker hair, some of my features, right? But I don't necessarily walk around fearing the ways in which I'm going to get attacked or harassed just based off my race. As a woman, that's different. My race or skin color, not necessarily. However, that completely changes when I walk with my mom who wears a hijab and is very uh, visibly Muslim, right? And then that's going to change. And so these are all just things that I'm going through this quickly just for the sake of time, but I really want us to be conscious of. I want, I want, and I think it's important for everyone in society to always be conscious of, right? And this is where we talk about checking your positionality, understanding the positionality that you come from before automatically speaking on an issue, right? So before me speaking about um, Black Lives Matter, right? I have to be conscious of all of my identities, right? Where are there any unconscious biases I might be coming from? Where are some of the ways that I can relate, right? Because of the cert certain identities and certain identities that I can't. So this is just really important before we can kind of start any conversation about allyship, working with other communities, it needs a personal reflection and understanding of who we are and the ways in which we navigate society um, and how we might be privileged and not privileged at the same time. Um, this is just kind of a continuation of what are the ways um, that this that oppression can manifest around us, right? So beyond the personal understanding of our identities and where we're privileged, we also need to be conscious of the spaces that we're in. So on an individual level, there are ways that you can be consciously and unconsciously biased um, towards someone. So for example, a conscious bias is an adult openly dismissing the thinking of a young person simply because of their age. And this happens all the time. This has happened to me a lot, right? From a very young age, from the minute of my activism. Um, at the same time though, right? A lot of younger folks do not take elders um, thoughts or oral history, et cetera, things that we can share as seriously, right? So that one kind of does work both ways. Um, an unconscious bias on an individual level could be organizing a party at, a, at an expensive restaurant where your working class friend has to choose between spending time with you and having something to eat. So if you're, you've never had to worry about how much something costs on a menu before and you, you're, you, you can go anywhere and you've never had to worry about that, you're never gonna understand someone who comes from a lower income family or lifestyle or whatever it is where they have to check before they're able to go to see if they can afford it, right? So, but if we had an understanding of our working, our um, class, right, at class or socioeconomic status before we organize the party, then we can say, well, I'm comfortable with this, but maybe others aren't. So let's come up with a place that everyone can have something that they can be able to and then share at the same time. Um, I'm not going to discuss each one specifically, but then, of course, the individual level goes up to the institutional level where the foundations and the laws of the institution that you are in. So whether that's a, usually universities and academia, we see it the most. It could also be corporations. It could be where you work. It could be um, the nonprofit you are a part of. Right. What are what are the, the laws, the foundations, the, the mission statements and the vision of that? Are they in some way unconsciously or, or consciously biased? Um, are were all the founders of your nonprofit all cisgendered white men who've never had to think about anything else, right, or never had to understand it, and therefore all of their laws, um, they might not realize make someone else uncomfortable, but someone with different identity comes in and is completely uncomfortable, right, and then of course we get into the larger societal and cultural norms um, that normalize and, and, em and emphasize or just kind of keep reiterating a lot of um, oppressive things, right? And, and these conversations came up a lot last year, especially when talking about systemic and institutional racism, um, when talking about Black Lives Matter protests and the movement here, right? The very important conversations that they started. So I just wanna make sure we kind of start with that foundation um, also when talking about Palestine, right? And when talking about Palestine, Palestine organizing and going in and working with other communities um, as well. And so the last piece of just our general kind of allyship, um, some of you may have seen this, it's also a little bit outdated, but I love this video when we're talking about how to be an ally. Um, and the main thing, the most important thing is allyship is a verb, it's not a noun, right? Solidarity is a verb, not a noun. You cannot claim to be an ally if you're not doing the work, right? You don't get to call yourself an ally because you shared something on Facebook. That, that's important, right? And you're doing something and spreading awareness on social media. But if you are not showing up, and if the members of that community do not know you and recognize you and give you the title of an ally, then you don't get to call yourself that, right? And that's 
my main thing um, for all organizing, for all organizers, no matter who you are. And, I, and this video, I love this video and the way she breaks it down. Hey friends, so I'm trying, hey friends, so I'm trying something different with my setup and I don't know if it's working, but you will deal. <laughs> Imagine your friend is building a house and they ask you to help, but you've never built a house before. So it'd probably be a good idea for you to put on some productive gear and listen to the person in charge. Otherwise, someone's going to get seriously hurt. Look, I'm helping. It's the exact same idea when it comes to being an ally. An ally is a person that wants to fight for the equality of a marginalized group that they're not a part of. We need to help build in this house, but you probably should listen so you know what to do first. Let's do this. So here are my five tips for being a good ally. Understand your privilege. Now, a lot of people get hung up on the word privilege, so let me break it down for you nice and easy. Privilege does not mean that you are rich, that you have an easy life, that everything's been handed to you and you've never had to struggle or work hard. All it means is that there are some things in life that you will not experience or ever have to think about just because of who you are. It's kind of like those horses that have those blinders on. They can see just fine. There's just a whole bunch of stuff on the side that they don't even know exists. So for example, there are currently 29 states where you can legally be fired for being gay. And there are 34 states where you can legally be fired for being trans. Now as a straight cis woman, those are things that I don't have to ever think about if I don't want to. I'm not going to be fired because I'm straight and I'm not going to be fired because I'm cis. So it makes sense that before I can fight for the rights of others, I have to understand what rights I have and others don't. That's privilege. Listen and do your homework. It sounds like a no-brainer, but it's not possible for you to learn if you aren't willing to listen. So you gotta know when to zip up the lipa. I don't know. You get what I mean. But that's the thing that's so cool about social media. There are so many people sharing their stories all around the world and connecting with people that they normally would never get a chance to without the power of the internet. So do your homework. Start reading blogs, tweets, news articles, and stories so that you can get caught up on the issues that are important to the communities that you want to support. Speak up. But not over. If the fight for equality was a girl group, the ally wouldn't be the lead singer or the second lead singer. They'd be Michelle. An ally's job is to support. You want to make sure that you use your privilege and your voice to educate others, but make sure to do it in such a way that does not speak over the community members that you're trying to support or take credit for things that they are already saying. This isn't Mario Kart. Stay in your lane. Realize that you're going to make mistakes and apologize when you do. Nobody's perfect. Unlearning problematic things takes time and work, so you are bound to mess up and trip and fall. But don't worry. You can brush yourself off and get right back up. I'm back up! Just remember that it's not about your intent, it's about your impact. So when you get called out, make sure to listen, apologize, commit to changing your behavior, and move forward. Last, but certainly not least, actually the most important thing on this list, is remember that ally is a verb. Saying you're an ally is not enough. You gotta do the work. One through four. One through four. As always, there are links in the video description box to some of the things I mentioned in this video. Um, so that... Again, she's a very nice, I love the way she kind of breaks it down and is able to summarize um, just some things that all of us always need to be conscious of, right? No matter who we're working with in the community, especially if we come into a community where we are more privileged than that community, right? And so now to take us into Palestine specifically and communities who have worked historically and currently um, in solidarity with Palestine, Palestinian struggles. Um, and I'm going to focus on three specific communities here. I'm going to talk about indigenous, Latinx, and the black community. And now I'm going to do black Palestinian solidarity a little bit more intensively um, towards uh, after this slide, because that was what more, all of my research and my thesis and work has been on. Um, but just very quickly, some images that I like to talk, that I like to show when right? we're talking about Palestine solidarity. And and this is this is very specific to, to two specific um, structures and systems in place that make these communities work together. One, indigeneity, right? So indigenous groups, especially in this country, and Native American groups in this country, there's a long history of Palestinian and indigenous solidarity. Um, most simply and most basically because, right, Palestine is an indigenous issue when we're talking about in a larger social justice issue, right? And it must be talked about as an, an issue of indigeneity and displacement from their land and es ethnic cleansing from their own land, right? And that's why a free Palestine means decolonization, land back, and the right of return, right? 
right? So in the same ways that this country was founded on the genocide and ethnic cleansing of indigenous Native Americans right now, and I very much encourage you all to look up and you, and I can put this link in the chat a little bit later, look up if you are in the United States, what indigenous land you are on. So here in Clifton, New Jersey, we're on Lenape land. Um, I'm born and raised in the Bay Area, California. So that was Ohlone land, right? And so um, know who the indigenous communities that you, who you are, whose land you are on, right? Know their names, know the tribe's name. Try to try to work with them, right? Try to reach out and see what are ways that you can support, that we can give back. Because that's the very least that we can do when we ourselves are profiting off of um, being on this land, right? And so that issue of indigeneity is what ties a lot of Palestinian and indigenous groups here together. Um, and so this, this video that I'm gonna show right here is actually from um, just a couple months ago with the most recent protests and kind of peak of Palestine activism, where indigenous groups um, went to a Palestinian protest and offered a traditional dance as a form of solidarity and support and love, right? Because there is that understanding that in the same way this country is founded on the ethnic cleansing of indigenous Native Americans, Palestine was, or Israel was founded on the ethnic cleansing and genocide of indigenous Palestinians in Palestine. Right? And we have to we have to understand that connection. We have to talk about Palestine as an indigenous issue when talking about larger social justice context. <laughs> It's a beautiful way to come in and offer a token of solidarity without taking up too much space, without having to be on the microphone, without having to make it about yourself, right? But you're there because you clearly understand it and you're providing something that is important for your community to back. And the second part in talking about Latinx struggle, um, dis Latinx communities are disproportionately affected by lack of movement or freedom of movement and migration when we're talking about this country, right? And so this is where this image is really important and comes out, comes up. And I'm sure a lot of you have seen it, right? This phrase that we didn't cross the border, the border crossed us. So on top of being uh, the United States being a settler colonial state that was founded on genocide of indigenous people, through the creation of it, right, we start seeing something called the U.S.-Mexico border. We do, um, undocumented folks are called quote illegals if you don't have the correct citizenship or if you don't have the correct documentation. Right, you're constantly in fear of being deported by ICE and you're not allowed in. And so when we're talking specifically about the U.S.-Mexico border and talking about like California-Mexico border, for example, there was a lot of um, Mexican folks who are already living in um, the now so-called United States before it got colonized, right? And so a lot of uh, Mexican people were indigenous to certain that certain parts in that area of the West Coast. And then all of a sudden there's a border created, there's a wall put up, not allowed to move freely anymore. And so we start prioritizing illegally created borders and uh, structures that divide people over people's lives, um, prosperity and livelihood, right? And that's the very exact same similar problem that's that with the apartheid wall that was put up in, in um, to separate Palestine and Israel or Palestine in post-1948 land, right? Where on top of coming in and pushing people out of their homes and, and pushing them into only the West Bank and Gaza, right? On top of that, within the West Bank, after taking more of it after 1967, right? After losing 1960 after Palestine and other Arab countries lost the 67 war, you go into the West Bank to also occupy the land that was supposed to be for Palestinians. And then on top of that, because of fears and this false victimhood narrative that Israeli settlers often and always hold um, during the second intifada, which both intifadas were caused or, or aggravated, and we probably don't have to say this, but as most, um, I'm not gonna call them clashes, but as most um, uprisings do, right? Um, it was a response to Israeli occupation, military rule and aggression, gonna use that as an excuse to claim the need of security and safety and put up a separation apartheid wall that really is only in the interest of expanding Israeli settlement, right? And so this idea of putting up walls and borders as if using the victim narrative and the security narrative, right? When you're the oppressor and the aggressor in the first place is very similar. 
And so that's how the, a lot of these two, especially these two communities can tie into Palestine. Um, to go into <laughs> Black Palestinian solidarity, um, I specifically focused on 2014. And so I'll quickly run us through 2014 Ferguson and Gaza solidarity and what was it that folks saw in each other and in these movements that made them so powerful and made them continue working together. Afro-Arab solidarity can date all the way back to the 60s with Malcolm X. We can get all into that history at another time, right? But, but, but we see this as a continuation, right? And this summer too, we saw another peak of Black Palestinian solidarity that was also uh, very beautiful. Before I get specifically into that, right, to understand in general why marginalized communities come together, we have to understand systems and structures of oppression that oppress multiple communities in very similar, although different ways, but still similar ways, right? And so that's how communities come together. We don't have the same identity. We don't look the same, right? We aren't the same people, but the systems and structures in place that oppress us are very similar, are very much tied, are very much correlated. So in the same ways that these systems and structures that oppress us speak to each other, then marginalized communities are going to speak to and rely on each other in their resistance, right? It's, it's kind of a natural inherent thing. We have to think about it that way, right? Communities come together in resistance on slut and solidarity because their oppressors have always been linked in the first place. And we know this, of course, if you've been through all the other series, we know how much the United States supports Israel, right? That kind of mother, daughter, father, son, parent, sibling, whatever child, you, parent child relationship that you wanna call it, right, are very similar. They feed off of each other. And so this is something that I created when I was doing this and kind of presenting my master's thesis of what are the ways where if you start all the way at the bottom, that racism and white supremacy are really at the root of both Israel and the United States and many other colonial powers in history and in our world, right? And the ways that they kind of continue to, to manifest and feed, up, feed off of each other and the reasons that we, that communities end up, and the reasons that this ends up leading to resistance and solidarity from multiple communities at the same time. And if we had more time, it would also break this down a little bit, but I just wanted to make sure we saw the systems and structures, at least visually that I'm talking about, right? So colonialism, militarism, um, highly militarized, militarized police forces, state sanctioned violence, imperialism, neoliberalism, human rights violations, illegal occupation, the prison, prison industrial complex and biopolitics, right? These are all the systems that lead right for people to need solidarity and need to resist against these systems that are put in place and so to continue it right similar structure similar structures of oppression are going to lead to something what are these similar structures of oppression um i always found this video very uh, this picture very powerful right it's a palestinian man holding a sign saying palestinian people know what it means to be shot while unarmed because of your ethnicity hashtag ferguson hashtag justice right so this was clearly met as a message to Ferguson protesters here to Black Lives Matter groups here, right? Is that we understand you, we go through very the same structural thing, not the same exact thing because we don't share the same identity, but the same structure is oppressing us and we understand that, right? And if anyone's gonna understand it or help you, then it's gonna be us. Um, and I don't know if a lot of folks have seen this video, but it's also a very good recap of what was a lot of the Reza Ferguson solidarity that came out in 2014. And a lot of it is very similar to what we saw this year too. What do Gaza and Ferguson have to do with one another? If you ask the Black and Palestinian artists and activists who just released a new solidarity video, a lot. Prominent figures like Miss Lauren Hill, Danny Glover, and Alice Walker came together in this three minute video with one strong message. When I see them, I see us. Harassed, beaten, tortured dehumanized, stopped and frisked, searched at checkpoints, administrative detention, youth incarceration. The poem highlights the similarities and the violence and struggles faced by both communities. Palestinian legal scholar and organizer Noura Arikat got the idea for the video during the summer of 2014 when Gaza was being bombed and Ferguson erupted in protests after the police killing of unarmed 18-year-old Michael Brown. I asked her, what's the significance of solidarity between Black Americans and Palestinians? The point is not to compare oppression. Blacks the world over have suffered from a legacy of racism much deeper than the contemporary Palestinian struggle. But the point here is that solidarity is a political decision on how to resist and how to survive in our respective fight for freedom. 
And it's a solidarity movement that has been steadily growing. Earlier this year, activists from groups like Black Lives Matter, the Dream Defenders, and the Black Youth Project 100, among others, took a historic trip to the occupied West Bank in Israel. The purpose of the trip was for young Black leaders to connect with Palestinians living under Israeli military occupation. So what are the parallels the two communities find in common? Here's what Detroit-based writer and activist Christian Davis Bailey, who co-wrote the poem in the video, told me. One of the biggest parallels I see between Black and Palestinian people is that we're each fighting really large systems of racism, militarized control, and state control. And we also see that violence against us is justified at the same time that our protests are criminalized or demonized. And one of the on-the-ground campaigns between Black and Palestinian solidarity groups targets G4S, a British security company that provides technology for American and Israeli prisons. Already they've seen major institutions like the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation, the United Methodist Church, and Columbia University divest from G4S. So can joint solidarity campaigns ultimately lead to policy changes? <laughs> So I think that was a pretty good breakdown of what are the systems and structures that um, bring Black Palestinian communities together. And so these similar structures are going to lead to shared forms of resistance. And this is how um, Palestinians, especially in 2014 with, the, with Twitter, were able to not just say we're in solidarity, but actually be in solidarity. And again, this is where the work, this is where it's a verb, right? And so um, if you see the, the image on the, um, on, my, on the right of the screen, uh, people in Palestine, because they have so much, unfortunately have so much experience with being tear gassed by, tear gassed by the IDF or Israeli forces, um, they were tweeting at black protesters and Black Lives Matter, their advice from their experience of tear gas, right? So. I mean, you can read it, right? It says, um, I used to remind myself this pain will pass, to not collapse, it helps. Of course, don't wash your eyes with water, run against the wind, um, don't rub your eyes, remember not to touch your face, don't use water, instead use milk or coke. So these are legitimate and actual tangible ways that you can fight against tear gas because, again, Israel and United States use very similar methods, right? And so therefore, those resisting can also use similar methods and help each other each other out in that way. Um, to keep us going, Angela Davis, of course, if you ever wanna read more about Black Palestinian solidarity, please read Angela Davis many, many times. Um, in her book um, about specifically Ver Ferguson Gaza solidarity, she says and reminds us that the Israeli police have been involved in the training of the US police. So there is a connection between the US military and the Israeli military. And therefore, it means that when we try to organize campaigns in solidarity with Palestine, when we try to challenge the Israeli state, it's not simply about focusing our struggles elsewhere in another place. It also has to do with what happens in the US communities, right? And, and this is exactly the point of why folks come together. If we come together and all communities come together, fight together, we're one stronger, right? And two, all of us will be liberated when one of us is liberated. So I always say when Palestine gets freed, that means all other communities can be freed because one, we can't do it alone and we need the help of everyone. And two, um, if Palestine is freed, that means we're gonna completely change and question these, sy these systems of policing and militarization and prisons and the prison industrial complex and hopefully be abolishing them in this country as well. Right, and so, and so this is very important that the IDF literally trains the NYPD. So they are also sharing tactics of oppression. Therefore, our people have no choice but to also share tactics of resistance just to be able to survive and to live. Um, Tef Poe is also, if you don't know him, is an amazing activist and poet and was on the front lines in Ferguson. Um, and I put this quote with this image because this image is very powerful, right? These, these are two different young boys, right? These are two boys and we have to call them boys because Palestinian and black um, youth become men and take their childhood, get their childhood taken away way too often, right? Who are in completely different places, completely different people, um, but the look of, of pain and their expression is exactly the same, right? And that always gave me chills. Like they're literally making the same expression, the same face in completely different places of the world, right? Because these systems are affecting them in the same way and their reaction, their pain is also going to be the same. Right? And this Tef Poe quote, uh, quote is really important because again, it reminds us not to blame the individual, 
but to blame the system um, that and the, and the larger system in place first. So he says a Palestinian kid throws a rock at a tank and instead of speaking out against the people who sent the tank to the village, we classify the villagers as the villains. A young black man or woman in Ferguson throws a water bottle at an armored vehicle and suddenly they're in the wrong as if a line of soldiers with M16s isn't occupying a suburban neighborhood, right? So this is again to challenge the victim narrative of our oppressors where, or that or the, we're acting in self-defense or we're the only democracy or we're the best countries, right? But what, who are you saying is the backwards terrorist person because they have a rock, but you're the one in the tank right, who took over their village in the first place and ethnically cleansed them in the first place, right? So this is where we have to take away vic um, looking at the individual and instead critique and take a look at the larger systems in place in the first place. And what I'm going to leave us with, and I think I'm ending perfectly where I wanted to, just to make sure we have some time for discussion or questions and make sure, um, just keep, be mindful of everyone's time, is some action items. Right, so what are some first steps? I mean, we're all coming from different levels of activism. We're all coming from different levels of solidarity. Um, but I think no matter where you're coming from and what level you're coming from, you can always learn, right? We can always be, everyone can always be learning more no matter where you're at. Um, and so we, I've actually put together, and PAC has been circulating this Palestine resource guide that has a bunch of different resources within all different categories. So if you're a reader, if you like to watch documentaries, if you like to listen to music, et cetera, et cetera, um, there's all different categories, everything related to learning more about the Palestinian struggle. Um, you can find that, that on our website. You can also find our advocacy action guide on the website. So I would start with the resource guide, know the history, know what's actually going on, know the terminology, listen to and read from Palestinian authors and creators and artists. They're out there. They've been saying something, right? Um, do your homework first and then put that into action and this action guide breaks down different sectors of public society different jobs you might have different areas you might be a part of and it gives you actual tangible ways that you can advocate for palestine in some way in that area and i'd be a bit more than happy to talk more about it if folks have questions about it i can leave my email you can contact pac um and 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 if in case any of it is confusing to kind of keep talking about it that was everything I had planned in terms of the PowerPoint. I'm sorry I went through that very quickly, but I just you know, want to make sure we're being respectful of time. Um, I'm going to stop sharing and then just open it up to thoughts, questions, discussions, comments. Um, and I'm checking the chat for anything that I missed also. What is the website for that? So it's packusa.org. I can also send, I'll send both individual links on the chat as well. So any thoughts, questions, comments, concerns with anything I shared? And I think this is where you can just raise your hand and we can unmute. I like that. Uh, tell us the size of. So I think there's 22 attendees in case that helps. Um, I can show examples. Yeah. So I just put the link for the resource guide in the chat, um, and then I'm gonna pull out pull up our advocacy action guide. Thank you. I appreciate that. Sorry, guys, I'm just trying to pull up the action guide.
while I'm pulling it up, any other questions or comments? Yeah, I think that's a really important point, right? So this gets us to think about other groups, right? What are what are other, and again, like you don't have to have a similar struggle or a similar understanding to be in solidarity with someone, right? In an ideal world, we'd be in solidarity with people just because we believe in the freedom and self-determination of everybody in the world. But it helps and it often pushes us a little bit more when there are similarities that we can't deal with, right? And I think that's a very good place to start from now is, um, We've talked about groups who have been in solidarity with each other. Are there ways, and of course, there are so many others. I don't want to say that these are the only groups at all who are the only ones in solidarity with Palestine. Those are just the ones I've done my focus and research on, right? But what are the ways that other groups also come together? What are the ways of elevating those stories and those similarities and hopefully creating a larger um, change? I can share the slides if you want to just send me an email or if maybe I can send them to Adam and you can share them with everyone who's on. I absolutely do not mind. Do you have some good guidance for people who are attacked for getting involved in Palestine solidarity, especially people who come from the demographic that is marginal political power in the United States? Um, I don't know if I have, but I mean, I always love and admire all the people that, that in my experience have worked um, in solidarity with Palestinian um, with Palestinian organization, my, my advice is we need you and keep doing it, right? But I think the biggest advice is just strategy, right? And so um, I think, and, and I've had to learn this so much. It's taken blood, sweat, and tears for me to learn the importance of strategy where I usually just want to jump and kind of like be very, I don't want to use the word intense because it's not fair to not call us intense or to call us intense in a bad way, right? I think intensity and passion is a really good thing. Um, but I think just thinking about the strategy and thinking about the long term, right? And thinking about what are you best at? What are you most passionate about? What are you, what, can, what services are you so good in? Or what access to resources do you have? And how can you give that back, right? And I think when talking about being in the university, for example, because um, it's very difficult to be in the university and part of academia as someone who is socially conscious, right? And so we would always talk about, um, we'd always use the word of the university or in the university, but not of the university, right? And so if you are someone who has access to university spaces and resources, um, and let's say you can't be as publicly vocal because you'd use your PhD scholarship, what are kind of certain ways that you can make interventions and disrupt and be an accomplice without it necessarily being like out there in a protest, right? And that this that could add the the so for example, you have access to a printer, you get access to free printing by being a college student, you get Wi-Fi, you get research hub access, use that access of resources um, to, to print for a protest, to do more research about something, right? To help get that divestment bill passed and you're kind of working on the sidelines and you're intervening and you're being very strategic um, without necessarily being that speaker at the protest and then your name is identified, your face is identified and you're thrown away, right? And those resources that you're able to help take and give back could actually make more of an impact than the speech of the protest. Not to say that the speech of the protest is important, but um, but right, that, that's kind of what I'm trying to say. I think it's just the strategy, right? There's there's always ways to be strategic behind it um, to protect yourself and in the long run give more back to the community. Um, can you 
comment on international campaigns impact on Israel versus ruling today? What do you think the next step for allies there for someone? I mean, I think the next step for the allies is to keep that international pressure that clearly Israeli courts are feeling when that's why they're afraid to make that. We all know what their ideal decision is, right? And maybe two years ago, they would have made the decision and nobody cares to just evict everyone. Um, but now I think because of the international pressure, right, and, and, the, and people are watching, literally watching Sheikh Jarrah and Silwan, um, we need to keep that going. Like we can't forget them because the momentum died down. Because I think that'll keep the Israeli, you know, Supreme Courts as afraid and fearful as they are now. I mean, I think it's not settling for anything less than staying in our homes as Palestinians in Palestine, right? Whether that I means occupied Palestine, but I think what they were trying to do was like you can pay to stay, but it's tech, you have to acknowledge that it's Israel, right? These are all just like small little liberal ways of just keeping the occupation going and getting what they want um what what was intended in the first place which again is the ethnic cleansing and displacement of palestinians this is the nakba in real time right and so i think it's settling for nothing less I'm sorry i'm just telling you my laptop it's settling for nothing less um and and keeping that international pressure and keeping the heat on israeli courts and israeli um powers and military and I don't want to speak as if I'm some type of expert. I'm definitely not an expert in anything. These are just kind of my thoughts and, and my opinions. Um, yes, someone talking about Latin American indigenous people's fight against their resources being stolen. Extract, yeah, extractivism is a huge problem in Latin America, right? Um, and here too, the theft of Palestinian natural resources. Exactly, those are definitely ways, right? Access to water, um, access, yeah, those, those are beautiful examples. There are many disagreements in political stances. Sometimes they hate each other. I'm not sure how concepts of allyship help me figure out how to relate to that. Um, so I think these conflicts and disagreements a lot of times come up because there's always someone or two, a couple of people who think they know what is best and that's it. And I think ways to mitigate that, especially when we're talking about Palestine, and I'm talking about this amongst and with this within Palestinian organizers and groups, um, I sometimes have to uh, tell everyone to just take a test, take a step back, because none of us are actually living in Palestine right now, right? And so, who are we to even have all these discussions of what is the right solution, and one state, and two state, and no state, and decolonize, et cetera, et cetera, without talking to people in Palestine right, right now, without asking them what they need and what they want, right? And I think the egos get in the way a lot when we talk about political disagreements. I think it's all just a lot of egos and elitism of I know what's best and so everyone should listen to me, right? And I think what we need to always remind ourselves of is disagreements are of course inevitable and no one's, I, what I like to, to um, earn to see Roy's quote that we're just working for a world where many worlds can fit. Right, we're not asking everyone to be the same. We're not telling everyone to be one homogenous group of people. We're just saying that we want a world where people can be who they are, right? Free and, and not being oppressed because of their identity, of course, with the respect and right, solidarity and, and like all these other beautiful things that make society run. Um, but I think that's where I think of it. I think egos get in the way. I think elitism get in, gets in the way. I think if we could all just take a step back and actually think about who is actually being um, affected the most by the oppression that we are fighting against, right? And what is a world where all of our worlds can fit really look like? And that would be kind of an ideal way to mitigate that. One of the things to be conscious of as Americans is that we are behind the curve of international community because our national commitment to military and cultural support and recognition of Israel and their breaches of international law, which makes it all the more critical to work against them. Yeah, exactly, right? We have a lot of privilege being American citizens. We also have a, a lot of responsibilities being American citizens because it is this country that we are living in, that we are a part of, that we are part of site, right? If, and if anything, that makes it our responsibility to criticize it, um, to, to demand for it to do better, right? Even if that means completely taking down and restructuring the systems that we have today. Yes, and it's just not settling for any of the, the compromises. Um, Yoshi, I just saw you, but the judge told Palestinian Palestinians less press time, time. Right, they're they're uncomfortable, right? And this is exactly this is a good step. I think this is we have a long way to go, but this the fact that they're even uncomfortable delaying it means something, right? Um, and I think that's what's most important and what's best to focus on. Um, if there aren't any more comments or questions. Um, I did put both links to resource guides in the chat. 
Um, Adam, if you're okay with it, I think I'll just share with you all the slides. And if you don't mind just sending it to folks who are on, unless not everyone wants them, then I can just send them to, I think I saw the one email. Um, yeah, that'd be great. I'd, I'd be happy to. Um, and you know, folks can folks can reach out to Abir. Folks can reach out to me if you don't have Abir's info. I'll be happy to send Abir's email that you can best best reach her. Um, and yeah, if, if there's anything else that I can do to support, just let me know. Thank you. And then I also just am just going to end by putting, of course, after the shameless plug, um, I work for the Palestinian American Community Center. That's our website right there. Um, there's a lot of tangible ways to help help us there, whether it's donating, um, subscribing to our newsletter, if you're in the area, keeping an eye out. But we have a lot of online events where you can learn about Palestinian culture and history and the struggle. We also have in-person events. Um, we have programs that you can support. We have newsletters that you can read, resource guides, et cetera. So I definitely just recommend you all taking a glance at that. Um, thank you all for letting me kind of come in and do this little spiel and workshop of mine. Of course, again, if there's any questions, feel free to reach out to me. Um, and I hope you all have a